Hey everybody, how you doing today? We're here today to talk a little bit about Sean Atwood's book, Unmaking a Murderer. I recently was on uh, was on Twitter and had Sean ask me if I would fancy doing a review, and I was like, yes, I would fancy that very much. <laughs> Anyways, uh, it's it's a really really good book. If you guys don't know, I mean, it's great. It's right here. You see it right there. It's, yeah, I mean, it's really really good. It's you know he just goes in to a lot of depth, showing past you know, indiscretions in Manitowoc by Vogel, the prosecutor during uh, the 1985 case with Penny Bernstein. Um, anyways, it's great. Um, the other great thing about this book, unlike, you know, Ken Kratz or Greaseback, um, the, the proceeds from this book are going to Brendan, Stephen, and also going to get getting uh, books in the hands of kids, like to schools and also in prisons, getting free books in the hands of people that can't otherwise get them easily on their own so that's what the proceeds from sean's book are going to so everything about this book is is really uh noble and if you have if you haven't checked it out yet you should and, and order yourself a copy it's on amazon and uh it's it's definitely worth the read i'm gonna go ahead and go over this thing here chapter by chapter so i'm gonna do um, several uh short videos maybe about four minutes each uh going into each chapter just kind of briefly skimming it um, because I don't want to sit here and, and, and read the book for you. Um, I'm just going to kind of go over what's in each chapter so that you guys can gauge for yourself about how juicy it is. And it's, it's pretty good. He, he got, he goes into a lot of detail. I'm, like I said, only going to be skimming kind of on the surface here. So, um, the first, the first chapter, well, first, before we get to the first chapter, the first, the preface is pretty fun. Um, he actually puts up the, le the, the, letter that Ken Kratz wrote to Stephen last year in around February. Um, and it's a letter that Ken Kratz wrote to Stephen where he's basically asking Stephen to confess to him and let him tell Stephen's story, um, you know, type of thing, this letter. And, and it's just very kind of condescending, this letter and everything. And when you read it, it I don't know. It's one thing that set a bunch of people off. I remember I was around back then. Um, I also recommend this book for you if you have only recently watched MAM and you weren't around um, on the internet and in, in these social media groups, uh, sharing all these you know uh, documents around and and bouncing ideas. This is a good place for you to start to get some of the info that was kind of real big um, in that first year. So just for the latecomers to MAM this book would be a real good place to start, I think, for you. So, anyways, um, the first... So, anyways, the, then the next bit is a letter that Sean wrote to King Kratz, <laughs> which is basically, like, outlined in the same way, kind of condescending Kratz, the same way that Kratz kind of condescended Stephen, and it's really funny, it's worth a read. I'm not going to ruin it by reading it here for you, but, but yeah, it's it's really funny to read, It's and, and it makes a point. It makes a very, very, you know, huge point. Um, you know, cause, cause Kratz, Kratz is just looking to profit. He doesn't really care about the truth. So, um, I'm more convinced of that more now than ever. So anyways, the first chapter, he, he labels the chapters as strategies. So the first chapter is strategy one and strategy one is to elicit an emotional reaction or trigger remote emotional reactions, particularly from the jury. And, you know, that's that's what he starts out with here, talking about how the prosecutors in these cases were using these um, very, very heavy-handed tactics, um, trying to elicit emotional responses from the jury and stuff. And by that, I mean they they use uh, very, very powerful techniques, uh, you know, uh, to manipulate a jury's perception and and to trigger these emotional responses. And basically, what that is is they. They use words, they wield words, and they wield gory photos and reenactments and various things like that to assault the jury's senses. Because if they get the jury all outraged, the, the jury that will then look for an outlet for that outrage is basically what happens in this type of case. Because we know that, particularly in Stephen's 1985 case, and particularly in Brendan's case, there is no real evidence. So putting up all that emotional... Uh, getting all that emotional reaction and stuff and, and doing all that for its own sake just to get the jury riled up is really an unfair thing to do. But what are you going to do? It's obviously allowed. It happens. So, But that's a trick that prosecutors use to assault the jury's senses and, and, and kind of get them outraged and look for 
a place to channel that outrage, which tends to be the defendant, of course. So, so that's what he's talking about here. And he, and basically in this chapter, he, in this strategy, he goes over Ken Kratz's first, he goes over Ken Kratz's press conference, which was ridiculous and should have never happened. So he goes over that. Then he goes over, um, basically he goes over what happened in court with Penny Burnson in the 1985 case with Steven. He goes over the, him asking Penny. He, he goes over the, the, the photos that they, that they showed the jury of Penny, um, literally a couple hours after getting to the hospital, they were showing pictures of that to the jury to elicit it, to, to trigger an emotional response because two hours afterward, Gregory Allen had beat her up pretty good, pretty badly. So that was triggering an emotional response. And, you know, and then, and then an actual Vogel actually calls her husband out from, from, from the, 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 sorry, the observer section and has Penny and her husband reenact everything pretty much right there in front of the jury, right there in the courtroom. Um, basically recreating the entire incident or whatever in front of their eyes. So, uh, and then it moves on to Brendan. So it goes into Brendan's case and, and, and how they used, um, you know, shocking, shocking things with Brendan's case. Um, the thing is, is that with Stevens 1985 case though, is that the fact there in, in no matter, I mean, it didn't matter the fact that there was 16, uh, alibi witnesses saying that there's just no way that Steven could have possibly been in that area at that time because he had been seen places before that time. And then he had a receipt from green Bay where him and his family had gone to green Bay and he had a receipt that proved he was in green Bay, making it pr impossible for him to have ever been anywhere near where this happened. And you, you find out, also, that they had a lot of reason to suspect Gregory Allen that they ignored. And, I mean, a lot. Not just a little. So, it's it's pretty, pretty fascinating stuff. Um, and like I said, I'm only skimming it here, people. You read this for yourself because he goes into a lot of depth. And, and I mean, he goes, like, word for word what Vogel's saying in the courtroom or what Kratz is saying and, and everything. And and then, and then in the in this first chapter, there's something in here that's really kind of gut wrenching. It's really, I mean, it's worth it's worth checking it out just to read it because you can really feel Stephen's pain, you know, in it. Where he he writes to the judge Hazelwood about his 1985 conviction, where he says he's basically asking, you know, why why should my wife have to raise my kids or the, raise the kids alone, and why should they grow up without a father? And he just makes this very emotional like plea to please to please help me or just to please look into this a little bit because I couldn't have been there you know kind of thing because there was a receipt and there was you know so 16 alibi witnesses but nobody would even bother to take a second look because he didn't get any response from that judge so anyways then it moves on to the tactics sorry that there, now it moves on to the tactics that, that Kratz used against Brendan um where he basically just recounts you know the the were the most damning parts of the coerced confession he um he basically recounts all the whole bloody gory story of what happened to Teresa and everything and i mean all this all this taken into account that all there is is this confession that is shaky to begin with and then the phone call that O'Kelly that happened because Lynn Kaczynski and O'Kelly bullied Brendan into confessing again and you know so so these are the only pieces of evidence besides all this theatrics that Kratz used to get the conviction so that's what this chapter is about it goes into a lot more depth than I'm going into here um you know that pretty much covers this this strategy you know just uh triggering emotional responses is what they were doing so uh, we're going to next move into the next video will be uh strategy two which will be concealing other suspects because we don't want them suckers hanging around and giving us trouble, right? Because we got to frame this guy. Thank you for watching, and please hit subscribe.